Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining me for the seventh podcast of the Solar Coaster Reading, A Diary of Me by R. Kelly. And you are now linked with R. Kelly Appeal TV. So let's get started with the reading. Ribbon in the Sky. By the end of ninth grade, Miss McClinn told me I was ready to enter the school wide talent contest. I was still too shy and wanted to wait, but she insisted. She said I could practice it in our class before I sang it in the auditorium in front of the whole school. But even in my music class, my shyness had me acting strange. It was Miss McClinn who handed me a pair of sunglasses and told me to put them on, and it worked. I pretended to be Stevie Wonder. That was easy because I was doing his ribbon in the sky. My classmates encouraged me. They gave me the confidence to sing before the entire student body. On the day of the contest, I wore the shades. I even had my friend Larry Hood guide me on stage like I was blind. I was still too shy to look at the audience and sing. Charles Craig accompanied me on piano. When I got to the line that says, there's a ribbon in the sky for our love, the screaming started. The screaming got out of hand. I was afraid that I might start a riot, but I was also enjoyed. Girls were screaming for me. Everybody was screaming for me. That's the day, like Peter Parker, I got bit by the spider, a music spider. If Peter was Spider-Man, I became Music Man. I got a feeling that day that I had never gotten on the basketball court. I felt love like I had never felt from anyone except my mother. This time, it was coming from 500 people in an auditorium, but it felt like a million people to me. I wanted to experience that feeling again and again. I had taken a chance, got my courage up, and earned those screams. I'd earned the audience's love. That feeling of connection began to replace a lot of the darkness. It eased the shame I still felt inside. I went from feeling out of place to thinking that maybe, just maybe, this was the reason I graduated. Maybe this school was exactly where I was supposed to be. Miss McClinn saw me as a winner and did everything in her power to make sure I saw myself the same way. But I couldn't. No matter how good it felt to make music, I couldn't get away from the fact that I was at the very bottom of my class. In a school where hundreds of kids were reading their books and finding their way, I was lost. History, geography, science, and literature, they all require reading. I started to wear the sunglasses all the time in school, hiding behind them, hoping no one would see me, call on me, or realize I was even alive. I'd walk down the hallways, practically hugging the wall, dragging my head against it like I was crazy. I ran from the classes and started locking myself into a little room at the back of the music room. It was really just a storage closet no one used with a lot of junk in it, some broken down chairs and an up, untuned upright piano. I went in there every day, basically just to hide, but while I was hiding, I figured I might as well try to play the piano. I wanted to show Miss McClinn that I could play the piano too, like Craig. I started messing around, messing these little two finger chords. It was slow, but they sounded good to me. Two fingers became two fingers and one bass finger, on the other hand, that became three fingers, then four fingers, bass became one finger, then two fingers, and so on. I did this for a whole year. It was really how I started writing songs on the piano. By the end of that school year, I had so many songs I had learned and written on the piano. Miss McClinn tried to figure out just how I was learning so quickly. She had no idea that I was practicing and teaching myself every day in that closet. On the negative side, I was ditching all my classes and hiding out in the storage room. When the bell rang, I put on my dark shades, leave the room, and walk down the hallway like I was going to class, but then turn around and go right back to the room. I never walked the hallways without my shades. I felt like they made me disappear. I kept my head down. I did this for a long time, and then I got caught. The school was about to kick me out, and rather than face my mother who'd whip my behind when she found out how much I, school I'd skipped, I decided to run away from home. I was feeling a little nuts. Somehow Miss McClinn 
found out what was happening and called me to her office. You've got to stay in school, she said. You've got work to do. I can't do my schoolwork. I said, I can't stay in school. You'll get help, Robert. I'll see to it. The principal says I'm beyond help. She told me that um, with all my failing grades and all these classes I've skipped, she's throwing me out. I don't want to be there when my mother finds out. I want to be on the bus going to Alaska. I'll see the principal myself. Next time I knew, Ms. McClinn took my hand and walked me into the office of the principal, who was a take no prisoners kind of administrator. I felt like the scarecrow brought from an audience with the Wizard of Oz. I'm a little busy right now, the principal said. So am I, said Ms. McClinn, busy training my best student to be an important musician whose influence will be felt the world over. My only problem, though, is that he says he's being expelled. He is. That's unacceptable. I cannot stand idle by. He needs an education. It's not like he's game banging or selling drugs. The boy's doing his best. That's not what my reports say. Your reports are wrong. I should know I'm his teacher. His other teachers don't agree with you. They share my view that Robert is not an acceptable student. Let me be direct, said Ms. McClinn. You always are, said the principal. Robert has failing grades, she defended, and there's nothing more I can do. Well, there's something I can do, my teacher replied, standing up and pointing her finger directly at the principal. I can go to the press and tell my story. I can tell them that we have a musical genius at Kenwood who is being kicked out. I can tell them the truth. Here at Kenwood, talent has blossomed. And this young man in question is brimming with talent. Your choice is simple. You see it that he gets help. You see to it that he gets help or I see to it that your treatment is reported far and wide. Well, if that's how you see it, Ms. McClinn, it isn't how I see it, she said, it's how it is. Ms. McClinn saved the day. I got to stay in school. I had taken a long time to this turning point. Music, not basketball, became my calling. I saw that, I felt that. For the first time, I felt like I was being introduced to my true self. Meeting the real Robert was a profound healing for me. I dedicated myself to music. I also dedicated myself to helping Miss McClinn in any way I could. I owed her everything. She took me all over the city. When they lit the big Christmas tree in downtown Chicago, she had me sing Joy to the World. That night, I was on the news. When Oprah asked Ms. McClinn to put together a choir, I was in that choir. One day my mother asked, why are you spending this time with that woman outside of school? Because she's getting me on TV. She's telling the world about me. Last month, she even took me to, to her church, the Holy Vessel, where she's the pastor. She had me sing. And during her sermons, she even talked about me. How is a teacher going to be a pastor too? Sometimes God put, puts people in places and it was because Robert needed a certain kind of schooling. I don't know, but she is. Well, you don't need to be going to her church. We got our own church. You're my boy, not hers. The fact that my mother was jealous of Miss McClinn's being a part of my life made me love my mother even more. But Miss McClinn was changing my life. She was giving me a future. I needed to keep going to her church. When she sat down and played the piano in church, for example, she had me sitting on the bench next to her. I was there to turn the pages on her sheet music. I couldn't read the music, but when it was time to turn, Miss McClinn nodded at me. I turned the page perfectly. Everything I did for Miss McClinn, I wanted to be perfect. Miss McClinn wanted to take me on a Memphis tour to a convention. She was going to play and she was going to have me sing. I was excited, never been outside of Illinois, never been on a plane. I was going to be able to learn a lot, see a lot and be with the choir. You can't go to Memphis, my mother said, but decision is final boy. It's too far away from here and God knows what goes on at that convention. It's a gospel music convention. <laughs> um, oh my God, I have to say this and this is outside of the book. God knows what goes on at that convention. Well, Miss Kelly, God knows what went on in your house. Back to the book. <laughs> it's a gospel music convention. You don't think gospel folk party? 
But Miss McClin will be watching out for me. Miss McClin in this, in, in this, and Miss McClin in that. Boy, all I hear you talking about is Miss McClin. I'm tired of hearing about that woman. I kept begging, but couldn't convince my mother to let me go to Memphis. Then one night she came into my room and saw me crying. What's wrong, son? She asked. I just want to go to Memphis. I really do. I could see that my mother was moved by my tears. Finally, she said, well, I need the good Lord placed in Robert's life. And for that, I'll always be grateful. Okay. Well, let me just talk to this lady and see what she has to say for herself. Right then, I got a burst of joy and confidence. I felt like things were going to work out. A few days later, Miss McClam was in our kitchen talking to my mother. I just had to meet this person who's got my son smiling more than I do, Mom admitted. I know I've been taking up a lot of your son's time, Miss McClam responded. You sure have. And I know how much he means to you. He means the world. And all I can say is that no one, can or will ever take your place. You got that right. You are the person who first inspired his music, Miss McClain continued. And I know that for the rest of Robert's life, you will continue to be his main inspiration. Glad to hear you say that. Well, it's the truth, but sometimes God puts people in places where they need to be. I know the good Lord placed me in Robert's life because Robert needs a certain kind of schooling. And for that, I'll always be grateful to God. Praise his holy name. Amen. So what I'm saying is that Robert has has a destiny. You're the main ingredient to that destiny. He was born of your flesh and he contains all the music that God put in your heart in a much smaller way. I'm also part of Robert's destiny. I was put here to show him certain things, encourage him to in certain ways and take him to certain places. God wants me to take him. My mom started to answer back, but didn't. At that moment, I felt her jealousy melting like an ice cube in a noonday sun. Soon they were talking heart to heart, mother to mother. A week later, I was on my way to Memphis. In the basement. In high school, I was this nappy headed kid. Sure, I helped. It helped when I started singing, but I couldn't really compete with the guys who wore Izod shirts and the fresh Adidas sneakers. They had money and I didn't. I came from the hood. I used to draw the alligator on my shirt. I do it carefully and hope nobody looked too closely. It seemed like ever since I started doing talent shows, pretty girls started paying attention to me. I met a girl in school named Suja who seemed to like me for who I was. I didn't have a crush on her, but she was pretty and sexy. So we ended up getting together. I appreciated how Suje uh, appreciated me, but I have to say there was another girl who I really got my attention. Her name is Billy, and we're still friends today, but she, she'd see me only at her mom's house. She wouldn't really associate with me at school. Billy was in a clique of girls that ran with the eyes out boys. All those boyfriends that were basketball players. I knew I didn't come up to her standards, but she was so beautiful I didn't even care. I'd met her on the QT, if that's what she wanted. I'd meet her anywhere. Then there was Charlene. She sang in the choir and was also a talented singer. Sometimes she wore leotards to class, sometimes ballet dresses. She was gorgeous. She was the Beyonce of Kenwood. Whenever I saw Charlene, I heard music. I got shy whenever she came into the room, though. She came from a beautiful family. Her mom and Miss McClendon were friends and she was talented. Man, I really wanted to get next to Charlene, but she didn't really see me that way. We were cool, but only as friends. And the only way I could change that was in make believe. When Miss McClendon asked me and Charlene to do a musical, a musical together, she did the choreography and Charles Craig and I wrote the music. I made her my girlfriend in the play. That's how I got to kiss Charlene on stage in public. In private, she wasn't having it. When I was 17, I met Chance, who was my older woman. My homie was kicking it with Chance's sister. She'd always call me cutie pie and shower me with affection. I had a deep crush on her. We'd, talk, we'd take walks in the park, go to the movies, talk all night. I, felt, I fell in love with, with Chance. Who knew more about lovemaking than me? She had experience. Um, 
Okay, let's stop here and start back when I was 17. When I was 17, I met Chance, who was my older woman. My homie was kicking it with Chance's sister. She'd always call me cutie pie and shower me with affection. I had a deep crush on her. We'd take walks in the park, go to the movies, talk all night. I fell in love with Chance, who knew more about lovemaking than me. She had experience, and I was eager to show her that I was mature for my age. We were falling deeper in love and learning about each other's body. Soon I thought I knew all there was to know, except to my surprise, I didn't. One day at my mom's house, we were making love in my room when I happened to look down and saw blood. I pulled out and saw that I was covered in blood. I panicked and started crying. What the hell was going on? I asked Chance if she was bleeding too. She said, yeah. She tried to explain something, but I ran out the room and went straight to my sister, Teresa. What happened? I demanded. You ain't bleeding, says, says she is. She's just having her period. Teresa explained how the monthly cycle works. I understood, but I also didn't want to go back there. The blood was too much for me. It freaked me out. When I when it came to sex, I swore I was done, and I was. I didn't have sex with another girl for three or four years. So that is Act 1. We'll be moving into Act to tomorrow uh getting busy <laughs> getting busy so um well this section here you know miss mcclinn she had a controlling spirit with robert and i don't know if that was something that was good for him or not good for him because it's like he wanted to play basketball he told her that and it didn't matter. What are your thoughts on how Miss McClinn treated Robert during this time? Because I know sometimes when kids are controlled like that, they can't think for themselves. And that's my fear. You know, even all the way down to the shades, the very things that she taught him, the very statements that she made about his life, it manifested into his life like holy like what if she had said that um something to the opposite of it would that have manifested in his life i don't know but to to be so controlling mm, that makes me feel like you know anything could have took place at that point but robert i think at this time was a chameleon he he was growing, his ego was growing into a chameleon type way where he just was the observer. He was running free and wild and, and just whatever he came about, he just became a part of. And that wasn't good. That's not good. Um, so yeah. Why didn't someone take him and help him with his reading? instead of pushing something else into the play. I wonder if he's going to learn, get tutoring or mentoring, which as we know, he probably did not because he never learned to read or write. So I hope he's doing that now, taking that time to himself to learn how to go back to school and become a better person to support himself, to just be a person that can handle himself. Um, and being incarcerated sometimes is the best place and the best time to take the time, you know, to, to learn how to read. So I hope he's taking that time right now. So I thank you so much for joining, liking, commenting, subscribing on this podcast. And if you haven't seen all the podcasts, we have seven to this day, you need to go to the channel and click on playlist and go to the solar coaster series playlist there you will find an organized set of all the podcasts from one to seven and beyond all right thank you so much and